Hello and welcome to the society with Fatma Shaheen at PTV World. They say that no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change. And today Pakistan by that yardstick is also then of course faced with several heat waves, uh, the frequency of which, uh, the duration of which and of course the severity of which has been increasing more so in the past few years. Uh, why are we experiencing all these heat waves and how can they in turn particularly impact not only the economy, the environment, but the society at large too. And this is something upon which we'll be shedding light today. In this regard, we'll also be talking about, you know, how do we now see the Pakistani government uh, working so as to combat such issues and then of course the need for there to be more effective resource management too. Uh, what role can the international community play with regards to, of course, uh, better technology transfer or even for that matter financial assistance when it comes to uh, tackling Pakistan's climate change issues and last but not the least what role then of course can the Pakistani society play when it comes to making those little changes uh, in our lifestyle so as to then reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, all of this today that too with an extremely pertinent panel let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for today's show is uh, Ms. Samia Saleem who is the project director of uh, Punjab Green Development Program Environment Protection and Climate Change Department. Assalamu madam and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Alongside her, I have Raja Rafiullah Saab. He is an economist. Assalamualaikum ji and welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. My third panelist for today's show is Ms. Zara Gilani, who is an environmentalist. Assalamualaikum ji and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. And via telephone line, we'll be joined by Ahmed Rafi Alam Saab. He's a legal expert and he's also an environmentalist. Assalamualaikum ji and welcome to the show. Now, before we start the discussion on today's topic, let's have a look at this brief report. Welcome to our special report on heat waves. These intense periods of heat challenge us, but they also inspire communities to unite and innovate. Economically, heat waves drive advancements in cooling technologies and energy efficiency, creating new job opportunities. Environmentally, they lead to increased tree planting and urban greening projects, enhancing our cities and improving air quality. Understanding the causes of heat waves motivates us to adopt renewable energy sources, reducing emissions and promoting a healthier planet. Communities come together through cooling centers and outreach programs, ensuring everyone has access to relief and resources. Governments and organizations worldwide are enacting bold policies to combat climate change, promoting renewable energy and sustainable urban planning. These efforts showcase our collective commitment to a sustainable future, paving the way for cleaner air, greener cities and resilient communities. Heat waves remind us of our interconnectedness and the power of collective action. Through resilience, innovation and compassion, we can turn challenges into positive change, building a sustainable and equitable future for all. Welcome back. I would like to start the discussion with you, sir. When we do talk about generally Pakistan's legal framework, we do understand the fact that you have had a very vast experience of working in this sector. So in this regard, when we do talk about the laws, which then of course impact not only climate change, but heat waves, so to speak as well, how would you look at those? In this regard, it's very pertinent to then highlight the fact that we do have a Climate Change Act in place. But practically, when we talk about bridging that gap between the laws, policies and practice, of course, how particularly do you feel can we just that. Fatima, your question about our legal system and its response to climate change and heat waves, let me respond by saying that the Pakistan parliament passed the Climate Change Act in 1997. And this federal legislation envisages a climate council with the prime minister, the chief ministers, uh, to set policy on climate matters throughout Pakistan. And it also envisages a climate authority that will implement those uh, policy decisions. Now, the councils had four meetings to date. I'm a member of the council, and uh, I'm glad that the council meets regularly, but I, I wish it could be more robust in some of its decisions. That said, the authority was only recently notified, and this is after uh, seven years of the act being passed. The authority was only recently notified last month, and that too uh, on the directions of the Supreme Court of Pakistan in a public interest litigation filed by the Public Interest Law Association of Pakistan. Now, other than the Climate Change Act, uh, the federal government has a national climate change policy of 2012 that was updated in 2021 that has a variety of adaptation and mitigation strategies for Pakistan to pursue to protect itself from the dangers of climate change. 
We submitted our nationally determined contributions in 2016, where we promised to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel energy and transition to as much as 60% renewable energy by 2030. And last year, the federal government adopted the National Adaptation Plan, which was a requirement of the Paris Agreement. Now, while these policy documents are all uh, very good to have in force, it is important to remember that most of the adaptation and mitigation strategies uh, for Pakistan are actually subjects of provincial responsibility. Things like agriculture, things like irrigation, uh, things like transport emissions or urban planning, these are all subjects that provincial governments need to have plans and policies for as well. So what we need right now is provincial governments to step forward with their own provincial policies. Not just that, the nationally determined contribution which uh, suggests that Pakistan will transition to 60% renewables by 2030 has a price tag of well over $100 billion, uh, which is money that Pakistan doesn't have. So just having these laws and policies is not enough. We need finances and political commitment to see them through and, and, and actually implement them. Now, with respect to heat waves, we have the National Disaster Management Authority Act of 2010, which sets up the NDMA, the Provincial Disaster Management Authorities, and even District Disaster Management Authorities. And these DDMAs have district-wise climate change hazard and vulnerability mappings, which informs them and officers of the risks each district has to various different natural and climate disasters, including heat waves. So presently, uh, heat wave response, and you might have seen this on television, is raising public awareness about the fact that there are heat waves and making recommendations that people take certain precautions if they go outside or not go outside if possible. But we need heat wave plans for district and cities, something that we don't have. You know, this is not just a disaster issue. This is specifically heat wave issues. And these specific heat wave plans need to be, I mean, we need to rethink the concrete jungles our cities have become. Uh, cities where people need shelters to go to now to have, you know, safe temperatures or um, will need access to electricity to run fans and air conditions and climate control. So government, especially provincial and local governments, need to act fast. Millions are at risk of heat waves and, you know, this is the coolest summer for the rest of our lives. Right, sir, your point is noted. But in this regard, sir, do you not feel then equally something that we do need to focus upon, a proper coordination between the provinces too? Because like you very rightly so mentioned, this is a provincial subject at the end of the day. Madam, I would want you to comment on this, but more so from your own work. So when we do talk about who is most at risk of climate change and of course the growing uh, issue of heat wave crisis, how would you bifurcate that to be? We do understand the fact that yes, of course, people who are more vulnerable, people who belong to certain socio-economic class, they might be more vulnerable to the risks of heat waves. But when we talk about such issues being given due consideration, that too at a law policy level, do you feel that this is something that has been taken adequately care of? I agree with your contention that uh, uh, climate change affects different groups of people differently. Mm. And the vulnerable groups mm. that involves women, children and elderly and trans community, uh, it affects them differently. Mm. Uh, they are the worst affected. So uh, under the Punjab Green Development Program, which is a World Bank funded program of Environment Protection Department, we are doing a lot mm. for the vulnerable groups. Uh, we have established Punjab Environment and Climate Change Endowment Fund mm. uh, worth 50 million US dollars. Mm. And uh, we'll give priority to the proposals which are for the benefit of vulnerable groups. Right, right. Then we are further going to uh, carry out a study to see the health impacts of pollution on vulnerable groups. More particularly. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. And uh, this is a study that we are going to conduct next year mm. in Lahore. Mm. We have, uh, I mean, selected the pilot for that. Mm. And uh, this is, we are going to get some good results and so that we can uh, make policies for the for, for the vulnerable right. groups. So you make policies which then, of course, adequately reflect these concerns and not only that, also take into account the gender sensitive angle Absolutely. too. Absolutely. On which, sir, I'll come to you. A question that I would want to put to you would be that when we do talk about this, more so from your own view, point that is that of being an economist how do you then see climate change more particularly heat waves impacting Pakistan's economy that too not only short term but also long term because we did see that in the case of floods more so which came in the year 2022 this did had a very adverse and of course a very grave impact on Pakistan's economy too so in this regard how would you describe uh, the consequences to be with regards to the heat waves too so Fatma thank you for the really brilliant question uh, and I think um, Hamel also alluded to this, for instance, that let it be uh, 
floods or um, heat waves. These are what we call uh, extreme weather related events. Right. And there is compelling scientific evidence mm -hmm. that uh, there is a link between humanly induced climate change and more f higher frequency of these events yeah. throughout the world. This inevitably leads to economic impact too. Right. So in the short term, for instance, you talked about the floods, you know. Mm. Uh, the floods uh, uh, in 2022 were at an unprecedented scale, but we have been receiving floods for the past like decade right. or so. You know? At the very short term, what happened was there is uh, there was impact on infrastructure, right? Mm. The infrastructure was damaged, the roads are damaged, the houses are damaged, the bridges are damaged. That is immediate cost. Right. But also in the short term, there is there are economic losses because the supply chains of are affected. Course. The business activity comes to a halt mm. and at a micro level, income generation activities are also halted. Right. So in this regard, when we do talk about how the heat waves are particularly impacting okay. the Pakistan economy, mm. how would you describe its impact be to be more particularly on the agriculture sector, yeah. more particularly also of course on the fact that now because of heat people are consuming more and more energy so to speak yeah. which can in turn actually lead mm. to there being a shortage of the same so all these things they are very interlinked at, to start off with yeah most definitely you know and uh, for instance you know uh, it is according to the pakistan labor force survey seven percent of all people mm. work either on the roadside mm. or uh, on the street in pakistan these people are directly affected by heat waves yeah. uh, by the scorching weather basically affects their daily -day activities because they also even even if they are willing to go out there and stand there on the street, maybe they don't get customers. Right. Furthermore, 35 percent of people are all engaged in the agriculture sector. Mm. And this is also most of the times uh, the activities are done outdoors. Right. So this is there, this has an impact, a large impact on the way the economy works and the heat waves uh, are going to affect in the short term, but also the long term. Uh, what we call these things are these are external shocks to the economy and they all get factored into our macroeconomic models. We at in Pakistan are experiencing low growth and high inflation. Mm. So if there is a heat wave, yeah. what happens is the business activity comes to a halt. Right. For instance, you know, recently the schools were closed down. Yeah. Uh, not only were we losing in terms of children's learning outcomes, yeah. but when a school is closed down, there you have to understand there is an entire ecosystem right. around schools. It has too. a very negative impact on the entire ecosystem. I yes. got your point. Yeah. Uh, coming towards you, Ms. Zara, I would want you to add to this, but more so from your line of work. Now we have studies to very clearly suggest that climate change per se is intensifying heat waves, making them longer, making them more frequent and of course making them more severe too. And we've seen that, we've been a witness to that more particularly in the past few years. So where do you see that link between climate change as it is and the growing uh, number of heat waves that we are experiencing, more so in cities like Lahore and Karachi? Uh, very true, Fatima. Uh, we've been witnessing these heat waves and heat events uh, in the past uh, couple of years and uh, the severity has uh, been increasing mm. and uh, we have to see where they're coming from. So when you look into it, you see that there are a lot of factors and a lot of processes that are taking place, not only locally, regionally, mm. but also globally. Mm. So um, uh, looking at the global aspect, uh, we see that the Arctic uh, mm. is warming and uh, it is warming more so seven to eight times the average that it used to. Right. For that reason, uh, there are dark spots now visible uh, you know, at, at the Arctic where the solar radiation is being absorbed. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, the Arctic is not taking heat from the ocean currents. Mm -hmm. Thus, the ocean currents are slowing down. And the heat remains trapped in the equatorial regions, in the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. and in the tropics. In this regard, you must be remembering the fact that nearly 62,000 people, they actually died in Europe just last summer, that too, because of the extreme hot weather there. But in this regard, when we do talk about how particularly does and then heat impact not only the ecological balance, but also, you know, population, biodiversity. So how would you see the link there? Yeah, uh, very true, Fatima. You know, I see that um, uh, you know all these uh, events are taking place at a rapid pace than we 
ever thought they mm. would. Mm. So 8 million people in South Asia alone at the moment are experiencing heat waves. Right. So these uh, events are happening so fast that, uh, you know, enough time is not given mm. to plant and the uh, plants and the animals to adapt to these new changes. Mm. So we see that uh, a lot of plant and animal species are going to be in extinct right. in the near future. So you see then again this is just not impacting humans it is also impacting animals at the end of the day. Uh, your point is well taken madam. On which I will come to you sir Rafi and I would want you to comment on this but more so when we talk about this with regards to having the right urban design specific intervention. So we do understand the fact that in countries like Singapore we, there has been focus placed on having more green spaces on having more urban forestry and then of course in New York we do see this ever growing trend of cool roofs so to speak. So what can Pakistan then actually learn with regards to perhaps having more intelligent urban design so as to then combat this growing issue of climate change and heat waves particularly. So how would you look at this and what would your suggestions be in this regard? Well, Fatma, there are plenty of things that cities can do to make them more resilient to heat waves. Green spaces are a great idea. Uh, but they have to be accessible to the public. It's not enough just to plant trees in an urban area. Green spaces, when I say green spaces for heat waves, must provide shade and shelter inside the middle of sometimes very, very heavily congested areas. So parts of the city will have to be redeveloped so that, you know, people have access to shade and cooler temperatures. People who need to have access to shelters to electricity for climate control, uh, climate control, and at some level, we've got to rethink our urban planning. So our cities are less designed for car users and more and more designed for the benefit and protection of the citizens who actually live there. That's very rightly put by yourself, sir. And in this regard, we must definitely strive to make our cities more climate resilient too. But when we talk about this, madam, from the viewpoint of us then observing the fact that a lot of people are actually migrating because of such extreme temperatures, something that we do see happening in Sindh particularly, that too in the past few years. Do you feel that these are those issues which are then given ample consideration at a policy level? You have rightly pointed out a very important issue, uh, internal displacement because of climate change right. impacts. So uh, we have seen um, as per um, internal displacement monitoring centers report mm -hmm. since 2020, 1.1 million people have been displaced in Pakistan because mm -hmm. of climate impact, mm -hmm. climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen, uh, we have uh, this uh, national climate change policy updated in 2021 talks about uh, giving more job opportunities to vulnerable communities and coastal area people so that preventing them from moving inland. In the same manner, Punjab climate change policy which is still a draft. Mm -hmm. We also talk about effective disaster management and we also talk about uh, uh, diversifying livelihoods. Right. I am aware of a project which is uh, being uh, in, done in collaboration with International uh, U United Nations International Organization for Migration right. and Ministry of Climate Change and mm -hmm. they are studying and they are building Pakistan's capacity right. uh, to deal with internal migration and bringing these considerations into adaptation policy and planning. Right. But another question that I would want to put to you is that which then of course relates to the uh, reasons because of which we now do have such a growing number of greenhouse gas emissions. We do understand the fact that yes, the transport sector has a very big contribution so as to add to the greenhouse gas emissions but we also see that the government has taken quite a few commendable steps in this regard so as to curtail or for that matter mitigate the impact of the transport sector so to speak. When we talk about this more so with regards to the various initiatives that the government has taken we do understand the fact that yes electronic bikes have also been introduced so what more has the government done in this regard so as to at least you know do away with the detrimental impact that the transport sector then has in adding to the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, actually, the government is working on uh, uh, two dimensions. Mm. Uh, one is related to new vehicles that are being procured. So the government is considering uh, uh, enforcement of Euro 4 and higher standards mm. uh, for the new uh, vehicles that are being purchased. It is still in consideration. Also, the private sector is being motivated uh, to uh, bring in the fleet of uh, electric buses. Government is also procuring uh, electric buses. Mm -hmm. uh, in Lahore, under Punjab Green Development Program, we are mm -hmm. going to launch 27 electric buses on one route in 
Punjab in Lahore. That's great. Uh, and the other side is the, is the regulatory side. Mm. How we are, I mean, that relates to the engine quality, uh, mm. the aging of the the age of the vehicles, then mm. also transport system, mm. uh, the management public, system. The public transport infrastructure, that in itself needs to be very strengthened. Absolutely. And then you see when we are talking about this with in the context of the ever growing heat wave, we also need to ensure that yes, if we are encouraging people to use public transport, then it should be very comfortable for them to do that. Because this again is a very, you know, globally recognized issue. Even world over, we see that people, when they do resort to using, you know, public transport, it's made very comfortable and very safe for them, so to speak. So I do hope that these are issues which are also given due consideration to. But on which I'll come to you, sir. Another question that I would want to put to you is the fact that we now do understand the fact that, yes, uh, the vulnerable groups, they are more disproportionately impacted. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to mitigating this harmful impact on those, of course, who are perhaps less affluent, how particularly do you feel can we do just that? Do you not feel here that integrating various initiatives, even financial assistance with climate induced events, that would be the way forward? Yeah, again, I think I totally agree with you on this. We already have the Benzer Income Support Program mm. and that's been going out for quite some time now. We have successfully been able to integrate them with health initiatives and education related initiatives. But I think uh, it's very important for us on a sustainable basis to make use of that network that the Bainzir Income Support Program has to reach out to, in the case of events, such events, and uh, to increase the resilience of those populations that are more disproportionately affected, such right. as the poor, mm -hmm. and also those people who are daily wage workers. And also, I think there's very important, uh, uh, like strong scope for mm making sure that we integrate the program with different industries within the sector too. So true. For instance, like mm -hmm. agriculture and construction are industries that are disproportionately affected. That's so true. Because of mm -hmm. these events such as heat waves. Right. So basically then all in all we do need to then consider perhaps informal workers too. People we yeah. might in the normal course of things unfortunately just ignore. Mm -hmm. And in this regard then of course do this from the viewpoint so as to then mitigate the economic cost which would then come on such people because mm -hmm. of being impacted by heat waves mm -hmm. because of course if you're poor mm -hmm. then it, it would cost you more so as to get yourself treated if you mm -hmm. fall ill that too because of the heat waves mm -hmm. on which I'll come to you Ms. Zara and I would want you to tell us about this very interesting program that you are running by the name of Miracle Bee Training Workshop so what all does this program then entail and how do you feel that by running this program uh, you are actually helping people understand not only the importance of bees but also how bees in turn can also help us better balance the ecological balance too. Uh, Fatima, uh, I've been working very hard on this project, uh, beekeeping and bee conservation mm. project. Uh, this uh, I initiated because I saw that the bee population was in decline mm. while I was working uh, as an environmentalist and uh, we came face to face with so many agriculturists mm. and, uh, and we gathered all, all this data mm. that how these heat events and uh, with climate change, the habitat loss, uh, the With bees heat are waves. heat waves. The bees are being affected. The right. colonies are uh, diminishing. Hmm. So uh, we started to uh, give beekeeping workshops at uh, schools and colleges uh, because it is the youth that are now going to make a mm. difference. Mm. Uh, we need to educate them and inculcate in them these values. Right. You say that you want to educate them and you have been conducting these workshops and not one of the various educational institutions, but how are you particularly training people so as to better handle bees? Because then again, this is a skill that yes. you need to inculcate. Yes, these are the hands-on beekeeping workshops where yeah. the uh, students, uh, you know, they practically do practicals and they get to learn mm. not to be afraid of the bees uh, because, uh, you know, they are not such creatures. Mm. Everything has to be done in a, in a proper way. Mm. Uh, so in these workshops, mm. uh, we spread the awareness that mm. why bees are so important and what benefits are we going to derive from the enterprise other than uh, honey, bee venom, uh, bees wax. Bees are great pollinators. They mm. pollinate acres of uh, crops and which contributes to 70 percent of all the food that the humans consume right. so uh, i think that uh, in right. the coming times when you're going to have droughts and mm. you know uh, there's going to be food scarcity we are going to really understand that how vital the bees 
uh, how vital the bees are in yeah. helping us maintain a more healthy, healthy ecosystem. ecosystem. And this again you see is very important because you are by that yardstick not only engaging uh, Pakistani young people, education institutions, but the community at large too, which has an extremely important role to play when it comes to doing away with not one or the various environmental challenges that the Pakistani society is faced with. On which sir, I'll come to you and I would want you to add to the discussion further, but more so from the viewpoint of this very glaring issue of water scarcity in Pakistan. Now we do understand the fact that uh, we have seen that climate change, even heat waves, so to speak, have over a period of time intensified the issue of water scarcity in the country. But having said that, when we do talk about the solutions to the same, how particularly do you feel can we work towards that? Uh, more so with regards to having perhaps a more effective and sustainable management of our resources. Water scarcity is an interesting subject. Uh, indeed, Pakistan is water scarce, but this doesn't mean that we don't have water. I mean, please consider that under the national water policy of 2018, we're told that uh, as much as 90% of the water resources in Pakistan are used in agriculture. And we produce four major crops. We produce cotton, rice, sugar, and wheat. We produce other crops as well, but cotton, rice, sugar, and wheat are the four major crops. And uh, cotton is exported out of Pakistan, so is rice. And sugar is a very water-intensive crop that makes a handful of industrialists extremely rich. The issue with water scarcity, when looked at this way, is that we have plenty of water in Pakistan, but it's actually consumed and used by a handful of industries and industrialists for immense profit, creating scarcities elsewhere. Now, I think there are plenty of things that we can do to improve this situation. Uh, one suggestion is to price water, not so that provinces can make money off the revenues, but rather to promote and change behavior in irrigation so that we have less reliance on water-intensive agriculture. But I think Overall, we need to rethink this equation that we have, where 90% of the water resource of Pakistan is put into agriculture, where approximately half the labor force works, and produces less than a quarter of the GDP of Pakistan. Surely there are better ways to use this precious and valuable resource so that there is no scarcity and that it can benefit both economically and, and environmentally the entire population. Uh, that's very rightly put by yourself, sir, because in this regard, we also understand the fact that, yes, of course, it all boils down to having proper water resource management, so to speak, on which I'll come to you, madam. Uh, another question that I would want to put to you is the fact that when we do talk about the stats, we all are clear on this very simple fact, which is that uh, Pakistan contributes a less than 1% of global green uh, gas emissions. But at the end of the day, we unfortunately still are one of those countries which are perhaps worst hit by climate change. So if you are to then of course talk about this more so from a global and international perspective what do you feel is it that it needs to be done so as to perhaps better mobilize the international community so as to help pakistan tackle its climate change crisis because you see at the end of the day this is something which is just not specific to us as a pakistani society this is then again of course an issue which not only pakistan rather the developed world also faces Absolutely. Pakistan is worst affected by climate change, uh, right. even though our contribution is far less than many other countries. So the only thing that we can do to tackle with climate change is adaptation mm. and building resilience into our systems, into mm. our infrastructure, mm. uh, developing technologies that are, uh, I mean, climate responsive. Mm. Uh, for example, our agriculture, it is one of the worst hit. Mm. Um, uh, we need to develop uh, uh, climate resilient seeds and uh, agricultural practices. Right. Uh, so uh, we need to appeal to the international community to help us because mm. we are not we are one of the lowest contributors to GHGs. Right. And uh, you see that even though we contribute less, we are still going to be affected by climate change. Mm. Uh, we are. I mean, uh, we are. Uh, we have Russia in the north, China in the north, then we have India, and they mm. are one of the, they contribute about 40% of the total GHG emissions. Mm. So uh, we are going to be affected, and we need to appeal to the international community mm. to help us adapt, to help build resilience. That's very rightly put by yourself, and in this regard, uh, doing away with the, the growing and the rampant use of, you know, single-use plastic, so to speak, as well. On which, sir, I'll come to you in another very important question. I want
I would want you to comment is the fact that we do understand that the conference of parties and of course the UNFCCC have been working so as to have the right climate change and of course climate justice related mm. conversations. But the question then goes back to the practicalities. Mm. How do we see all the agreements made? How do we see you know things which are then agreed upon on mm. such international forums being actually executed in letter and spirit? Yes, Fatma. So again, a very good question. And it's not only a question, I feel a practical question, it's also a philosophical question. Because uh, these efforts have been happening for quite some time now, almost three decades. Mm. Uh, the Conference of Parties, the UNFCCC. Uh, but we, what we see is that there is an issue with incentives, you know. And, uh, but what can be, it's really important, you know, that we are talking about it right mm -hmm. now. But we need to transition from just having naming and shaming as a, a instrument for change was more enforceability. Right. So it's not only an economic problem, but it is also a problem of international law. Right. We need to come up with better models mm. to decide how different parties, which traditionally nation states, traditionally don't cooperate, mm. which other can cooperate together because this is what we call in economics the conventional tragedy of the commons. Right. If somebody is responsible for something, nothing happens. If everybody is responsible for something, nothing happens again. Mm. So it's for important for us to realize that we are at a juncture. It's important to meet, have discussions, uh, but we need to go beyond naming and shaming mm. only as our instrument for enforceability towards something that's more tangible. It's a philosophical issue. We are at a very critical time and juncture, not only as policy makers, but also as a species. Right, and also, of course, uh, the whole planet is at stake yeah. to start off with. Yes, most You know, definitely. if you go back to the basics, because these issues are then impacting not only mm. developing countries like Pakistan, but yeah. equally the developed world too. Yes. Uh, Zara, coming towards you, I think he's raised some very valid points on yeah. which I would want you to deliberate further. So when we do talk about taking, of course, masses, taking community along, how particularly do you feel can that be done, that too, through perhaps using media in a very intelligent manner? Because we do see that now, so many social issues they have been picked up uh, by Pakistani dramas, by Pakistani theatre and then of course we do see talk shows also taking up such issues too. So how do you feel can climate justice, how do you feel can climate change then find its way uh, in the media so as to positively make an impact in the society? Uh, I think uh, Fatima this is the most pressed issue of today that we are f being faced with to spread awareness about the climate cl crisis mm. that is happening, unfolding, uh, the heat waves, the heat events, mm. the flooding and all of this. So the more uh, we get a platform to talk about it, the better it is. Right. So I think social media is a very, very brilliant platform. Uh, whenever we do uh, these green activities, uh, workshops on beekeeping, bee conservation, uh, we uh, you know put it up, upload it on social media. Uh, for the people to see and mm. uh, you know know how to go about it what right. they can do in their own capacity right. uh, you know internationally if you see we see Donald Trump mm. uh, you know when he was in power he was denying uh, the mm. truth about uh, climate change right. so it is uh, it's a thing you know denying climate change mm. so it's it's a social media is a perfect platform right. to put up such issues we and need talk to do about away them with those typical misconceptions so to speak yes. and in this regard then of course i feel there's a very important responsibility that whatever you are putting up you need to fact check it as well because then again this opens that very vicious debate of you coming across fake news of you of coming across information which is not real it is misinformation or disinformation madam coming towards you because i do understand that you have also been very actively working on media awareness and of course reaching out to young Pakistanis so as to advocate for the cause of climate change. So tell us about the scope of your media awareness campaigns too. Last year under PGTP, we have uh, uh, formulated a plastic management strategy. It was passed and also regulations for consumption and uh, uh, use of uh, single-use plastic. So uh, we have utilized social media a lot. Mm. We uh, last year in December and January, we launched a campaign for awareness of people on the negative 
uh, impacts of uh, single use plastic right. on environment as mm. well as health mm. so we reached out to uh, we we went to divisional headquarter uh, offices mm. we carried out seminars there we used electronic media we had mm. print ads and also we used uh, social media and in fact we had held uh, a competition video competition of young school children right. so that was very widely received and it was largely circulated on social media mm. so it is a very effective tool for uh, um, creating awareness in people mm. and also motivating young people and bringing mm. them into as uh, as environmental stewards right and this is the need of the hour because you see then world over we do see people like Greta Thunberg leading such important Absolutely. climate justice and climate activism movement. So why not in Pakistan by way of analogy? So coming towards you and my last question to you would then be that when we do talk about the upcoming budget, it's very important to then also, of course, give due consideration to issues of climate change and of course heat waves by that yardstick too. So how do you feel as an economist can we then, of course, better look after the concerns of the downtrodden segments of the Pakistani society and that too uh, through the budget itself? So I I think the first prescription is the lowest hanging food, which is that you should increase, where the government should increase the uh, the budget for the social safety net programs. Uh, the work is already in progress. I've seen like the reports, mm. uh, but the increase year on year basis, uh, I feel is going to be a nominal increase, not a real increase because we have high inflation. Uh, so that is, but also integrating these programs, you know, is also important within the ecosystem and industries and so forth. That's right. another debate. But one last thing is also, I think, Madam also talked about it. There's also a need mm. to make sure whatever we fiscal space that we have, to divert that towards those initiatives that, in both in the short, medium, short and medium term, can lead to better policies mm. that can combat the harmful effects of climate change. Mm. So the, the, all of these need to be taken into account, but I think the main one is to protect you know, the disadvantaged. We need to make our social safety net programs more robust. and More wide, so that they better wide. address basically yes. issues which are then related to climate change and climate induced events. And I think yes. that is a very valid suggestion yes. put by yourself, sir. Okay. Uh, Zara, coming towards you, and my last question to you would be that when we do talk about making those little you know, differences in our own respective capacities with reference to, of course, molding and changing our own lifestyle so as to then reduce our carbon footprint, how particularly do you feel can we do just that. What are the tips that you would want to give to the audience out there? Uh, I think that uh, uh, we all can make a huge difference, but to begin with, yeah. uh, we have to change our priorities. We have to change our mindset. We need to educate ourselves. Uh, we need to spread awareness, and we can do that very well. Today, uh, you know, sitting here and uh, talking about the uh, environment, uh, I'm very hopeful that the viewers today are going to uh, lead by example. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that today's program is going to really motivate each China. one of uh, uh, the viewers mm. and they would be able to better comprehend the situation that they are faced with of uh, heat events and uh, how to deal with them so and how they can contribute uh, in little ways although these little ways I think together will be will, will make be a huge big difference of course. will be huge like uh, you know people used to say we want to be a frequent flyer or we want to have big cars now mm. uh, people with uh, you know understanding the reality on ground are not going to think this way right. they are going to change and they are going to look at uh, goals that are sustainable mm. uh, not only for themselves but for the society at large right. you know they are going to advocate to the government to provide public transport networks mm. Mm. everywhere and uh, they are going to think on a community level, not on an individual level. Right. We're going and you to see public transport then again, Zara, is just one thing. It's about different facets of your life at the end of the Very days. true. Very like true. not wasting water, like putting off the light bulbs when you're not using them, putting off electronic devices when you're not using them. And of course, having these climate justice, social justice related conversations too, which I feel are now growing day by day because there was this time perhaps a decade ago when we were not sitting and actually discussing 
discussing and debating on issues like these. So we do have to give credit to, of course, you know, people like yourself who have been working on this area, and then of course to media too, which has actually raised and mobilized the community when it comes to issues of climate change and climate justice. Uh, sir, coming towards you, and before we wrap up today's discussion, my last question to you would be that all in all, if we are to wrap up today's uh, discussion on climate change and of course the growing issue of heat waves, uh, we do understand and appreciate the fact that yes, these are very important and pressing challenges that Pakistan is faced with. But what more environmental challenges do you then predict should we then you know actually look out for and that too more particularly in the coming one decade? And when we talk about the community engagement, when we talk about of course the society being engaged and making its active contribution so as to do away with all these environmental challenges, how particularly do you propose can they be involved with regards to not only climate mitigation but also uh, perhaps leading a more sustainable lifestyle? Fatma, the climate future is bleak. There are enough greenhouse gases to lock in, you know, 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade temperatures, global temperatures, uh, by the middle of this century, which will mean untold loss and disaster, mostly concentrated in the global south. Pakistan is going to be affected not just by increasing temperatures, heat waves, as we've seen this summer and the last summer, but by dangerous and, and unpredictable precipitation in the monsoon. Our monsoon patterns are changing. The intensity and duration of the of the rains are changing. So we're going to see more rain flooding. Uh, we're going to see uh, more heat waves. Those are going to affect crops. And then, of course, we have the air pollution to deal with as well. In most of Pakistan, uh, the cities are so air, badly air polluted that people are losing years of life expectancy on account of that. So temperature increases, uh, flooding. Uh, and, and air pollution are three major concerns going forward. And we must take steps to improve the fuel quality in Pakistan. We must take steps to adapt to the incoming heat waves by changing our cities and our agricultural practices and by preserving and conserving our precious water resources. These things have to be done as a matter of priority if Pakistan and Pakistanis want to face a more resilient and sustainable future. Uh, definitely, sir. On which note, I would like to conclude today's show. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Ms. Zara. And thank you so much, uh, Rafi Saab, for your precious time today. Well, to conclude today's show, we generally spoke about the very pressing issue of climate change crisis and, of course, the growing issue of heat waves as we are experiencing them in Pakistan more so in the last few years. In this regard, we also spoke about solutions which would then, of course, better equip us so as to deal with our environmental challenges, be it, for that matter, more effective implementation of the laws and policies that we do have in place, be it for that matter, having specific interventions with regards to our urban design or at a very core level at the end of the day, educating the Pakistani masses about the importance of, of course, caring for the environment and being climate conscious citizens. We as a Pakistani society need to be very sensitized with regards to the environment at large and we need to educate young children about the importance of the same too. Uh, the time to act has come now. Thank you for watching The Society. Until next time, take care and Allah Hafiz.